And I'll give folks some time to um, join in. Good afternoon. My name is Lori Patton Davis and I serve as chair for the Department of Educational Studies at The Ohio State University. Thank you for joining us for our fourth and final conversation of the Dear White People Dialogue Series. This initiative is sponsored by the Department of Educational Studies um, and the Office of Equity, Diversity and Global Engagement, both within the College of Education and Human Ecology at The Ohio State University. The purpose of this dialogue series is to engage contemporary scholars on critical questions about whiteness and white supremacy in education, as well as strategies for disrupting rampant anti-blackness in education and in our organizations. Each conversation revolves around a guiding question. The question for this session is how do you show up for your black colleagues in schools and on campus? Thus far, we've defined whiteness, white supremacy, and anti-blackness. We've spent time discussing the role white people should play in dismantling white supremacy and anti-blackness. And last week, we delved further to define anti-racism and ways to make it actionable. Now, we want to round out the dialogue with today's conversation. Before we do so, I want to uh, give special thanks to Dr. Noel Arnold, who is Associate Dean for Equity, Diversity, and Global Engagement here at EHE, to Dr. Stephen Quay, Associate Professor in Higher Education and Student Affairs, both of whom were thought partners for this series. Uh, thanks to Dr. Rhodesia McMillian, who had our Dean's uh, Diversity Postdoc, who have been fielding questions for our first three sessions. She's not with us today. Um, but wanted to thank her for all of her assistance throughout the series. Now, I want to turn it over to our amazing panelists uh, and ask them to briefly introduce themselves and uh, talk about what they want listeners to know about them and their work. So uh, let's start, and I'm going off of what I see on my screen. Uh, let's start with Dr. Treva Lindsay. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Treva B. Lindsay, and I'm an Associate Professor of Women's Gender and Sexuality Studies here at The Ohio State University. I work on Black feminism, African American women's history, critical race and gender theory, and violence. And one of the projects I'm working on right now, which I think is very much so connected to this topic, is a recent history of violence against Black women, girls, and femmes, and all of the spaces in which they happen, including in the classroom and other educational settings. So I'm very excited to talk with my esteemed colleagues today about these issues and how to support Black folks uh, across genders in these initiatives to have a more liberatory and just space in our educational settings. All right, Dr. Dache. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Amalia Dache, and I am an assistant professor at the University of Pennsylvania. So my research focuses broadly on issues of college access in urban communities, but I study urban communities from a local and a transnational perspective. I use post-colonial theory and studies to frame issues of access having to do with transportation, um, I also look at histories of resistance within cities and, and counties in the Northeast and the Midwest. Some of my previous research focused on the uprising in the Ferguson community. And um, I've also done research in, in upstate New York. Um, I have just been funded by the uh, National Academies and Spencer Foundation this year as a postdoc to do work on Philadelphia's public housing um, and access in Philadelphia. So I'll be doing this for the next year. Um, and I'm also working on a study having to do with uh, Havana and Cubans um, across racial um, and political lines, um, and looking at issues of access and equity when it comes to refugees um, and dissidents um, in the Cuban context. So again, looking at resistance and post-colonialism within a transnational context, but focused largely on 
urbanization and factors that are affecting black, brown, and immigrant communities. Thank you. Dr. Brooms. Good afternoon. Thanks so much for uh, having me and inviting me to talk and engage in a critical conversation with my distinguished colleagues who are doing some amazing work. Um, and thank you to the audience members who are joining us. Uh, Derek Brooms, faculty in sociology and Africana studies at the University of Cincinnati. Um, I've got a couple of main research strands. One is on the uh, kind of educational pathways and successes of black boys and young men, pathways to and through college. Um, I also look at black and Latino college men's uh, engagement on campus, leadership, identity development, uh, and peer relationships. But also uh, m my work is really kind of nested in uh, black boys and men's life, uh, lived experiences and life outcomes. And so uh, another major thrust of my research is looking at the stereotype and profiling and the killing of black boys and men in the United States, which kind of also has kind of far reaching impact with regards to anti-blackness in a global sense, right? Uh, even though my work is really nested in the US context. And so uh, much of my work is looking at uh, equity, access to, access to higher education, educational equity, ways in which racism impacts negatively, overwhelmingly folks of color in general and black folks in particular, um, their experiences at various levels of, of education. So really looking forward to this conversation. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Haywood. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Jasmine Haywood, um, and I am a strategy officer at Lumina Foundation. We're uh, based in Indianapolis. Uh, we are a private foundation uh, focused on post-secondary education. Um, we are the largest foundation that has explicitly uh, dedicated our work to post-secondary education. Um, so essentially what I do is uh, grant making. So I lead our evaluation work at Lumina Foundation. I also do work around faculty engagement at four-year institutions. Um, and some, the, some of the work that we, um, re, that we recently uh, recommitted to um, is our Racial Justice and Equity Fund. Um, Dr. Patton Davis is a previous uh, recipient of a grant from that fund uh, when she was at IEPY. Uh, and we just um, allocated $15 million uh, into that fund uh, towards racial justice and equity, um, towards dismantling institutional racism uh, at, uh, in, in institutions. Um, so that's some work that, that we are excited about. Um, in my previous life, when I, when I was a faculty member um, in the academy, uh, my research focused on anti-Black Latino racism um, and the ways in which um, Latino folks within post-secondary education perpetuate anti-Blackness. All right, thank you. Thank you for being here. So let's begin with an opening question um, that I'm hoping all of you will respond to. So terms such as ally, accomplice, and co-conspirator are part of a larger lexicon to signal efforts by others to show up for Black people, primarily white people. Um, from your perspective, what does showing up for Black people mean? And more specifically, what does it look like when white people show up for Black people? What's one example? Uh, let's start with you, uh, Derek. Ooh, so much to say. Uh, um, I, I think we need to really vet terms and terminology. Um, I think there are ways that people use those as a particular brand of identity politic to gain some cachet, gain some capital, gain some uh, kind of personal vested interest in how they are positioned, maybe vis-a-vis -vis others, or even how they can be, you know, engaged in conversation. And so to me, you know, too often terms like ally and accomplice are used for some form of credit, right? Um, I've, I've even seen folks calling themselves an ally. Like, what does it mean if you get to claim you're an ally, but the folks that you're supposed to be doing work with don't see you as an ally? So I, I think we got to trouble and challenge some of these. Um, again, because I think too often people simply just kind of refer to themselves in these terms, but kind of as James Baldwin said, I, I hear what you're saying, but I can't believe it because I see what you're doing, right? So there's a lot of incongruence between what folks are claiming to be and then the work that they're, they're actually doing. And so when I think about 
kind of whiteness in the academy. And that's, you know, as a student, you know, across all levels and then as a faculty member, um, you know, what we're looking at is interest convergence, racial performance, ally performance. Uh, we've seen the dance, the dissonance, the distraction, the undermining, the collusion, uh, the extraction of labor, the, the, the credit snatching, um, efforts geared more towards kind of racial capitalism than racial equity. And so I think that's, you know, when I think about, when I hear those terms, that's really kind of my first kind of response is that who, who benefits from when folks are being called these things? Um, what does it look like in action? I think that uh, what we need more of is, is opposed to kind of allyship and uh, an accomplice uh, or even sympathizers is we need solidarity. Um, and so for me, kind of, you know, what does that, what does that look like? So, um, it means being committed to the work, right? Being committed in complex and nuanced ways. So in one regard, it means doing self-work, right? Interrogating one's own sense of uh, sense-making, assumptions, biases, habits, practices, privileges, and blind spots. Um, it also means raising one's critical awareness about how racism and anti-Blackness impacts individuals and institutions, as well as groups and communities. And then from here, it also means working actively to disrupt and dismantle individual, institutional, and structural racism, as well as anti-Blackness and white supremacy. And I will also add that, you know, just like Derek was saying, I think these terms are something that need to be really unpacked. And for me, I think it's almost more about action than the actual terms. Where, where is your energy? Where is your action? Um, are you funding, you know, through your programming, through your uh, institutions, um, African American and um, Black scholars and Brown scholars? Are you admitting these students from local communities? Um, so creating policies that uh, support tenure. Do you know the history? Do you know the research um, around, you know, uh, the pipeline? Like really actually doing actionable um, uh, items that you can hold yourselves accountable to and the community can hold you accountable to those actions. I, I echo both Amalia and Derek in thinking of it as a verb as opposed to a noun. It's not something you are. There are things that you do. And I think we have a lot of, as you said, Derek, this identity politics at play that we see like, I want to be an ally. I am an ally of X community. And that statement not only isn't backed up by action, but in doing that, you are taking some kind of power in identifying as such a thing where being a comrade, an accomplice, a co-conspirator, et cetera, is a practice of radical solidarity. And radical in this sense, I'm thinking of Ella Baker and I'm thinking of uh, Angela Davis of getting at the root of the problem. And if we get at the root of institutional anti-Blackness, you're going to have to give up something if you're white. You're going to have to interrogate not just the privilege that you have, but what are you willing to give up? What are you willing to put on the line? It is a risk to go against the very systems and institutions that protect you and give you space to have the power dynamics that exist right now. So if you're not feeling a sense of loss, in terms of showing up and doing the work, chances are you're not aligning and strategizing correctly in ways that disrupt institutions, that disrupt structures, that disrupt even inter individual and interpersonal dynamics, that you need to also listen to understand that, a radical listening process. What are your Black colleagues saying? What are your Black students saying? What are Black folks in your community, if there are Black people in your community, which you probably aren't because we live in such a segregated society, but what are Black folks in proximity to you saying about the ways that they're impacted by anti-Blackness? And then what are the action steps you're taking to address those specifically? So it's a listening, it's a doing, and it's an undoing as well, that you are actively undoing and putting your body, mind, and spirit on the line for the cause of usurping and debunking and dismantling white supremacy. Mm -hmm. I, I don't think I need to follow that up. I, I, I mean, <laughs> what she said. Okay, <laughs> thanks. Um, I want to go back because, um, Derek, when you were um, describing your uh, initial reaction to the question, you use some language. And because we have such a broad audience, we have some folks in education who 
you know, know what interest convergence is and who've looked at, you know, CRT. And then we have other people, you know, we have, you know, uh, teachers and educators and leaders in other um, sectors. And so I just kind of wanted to go back and either you or could one of our panelists talk, actually Jasmine, um, what's interest convergence? <laughs> Interest convergence is when um, a dominant actor, typically a white person or um, an institution, a historically white institution, um, does something to benefit uh, an oppressed group or marginalized group, um, but the, the benefits for the white actor outweigh the benefits for the oppressed actor. So um, a good example uh, of this is in our enrollment and admissions offices. Um, and, and I use this example because that's where I, I started my career uh, was as an admissions counselor. Uh, actually, when I was an undergrad student as, as a, um, an, an ambassador, um, Oftentimes, you know, on these, these beautiful pamphlets and flyers that institutions share, they um, are parading the faces of students of color in an attempt to uh, convey this false sense of inclusivity and diversity. Um, and so while, you know, while that might benefit the students whose pictures they're tokenizing or that might benefit um, the institute, that might benefit um, the, the prospective students of color in, in, see, in feeling a sense of belonging, uh, the, the benefits really are reaped the most by the institution. Um, because they get to attract students of color and, and thus, um, you know, money, uh, institutional dollars uh, w without actually coming through and, and fulfilling the promise of an, an inclusive and anti-racist campus environment. All right. Thank you. I want to I want to jump in because Jasmine is hitting something that that Amalia hit on earlier that I want to make sure that folks are hearing right. And so when we think about interest convergence or we think about racial capitalism, the ways in which white folks benefit from things around this, even if they're just discussions and narratives of inclusion and diversity. And this is kind of what Trevor was saying too, right? So there's a way for folks to continue to gain and benefit, gain advantage, gain privilege, gain benefit from the fact that folks of color are around, right? Um, you're, gonna, you're gonna use our presence to parade a facade of what this institution is really about when, as Amalia mentioned, your recruitment and retention practices are all jacked up, right? When your, your hiring and tenure, uh, forget practices, your hiring and tenure success is whack, right? So we, got, we can bring folks in all the time um, and you know, I worked at an institution where they had a plus one model, right? And so they, in measuring diversity, it was, if we just add one more next year, we've increased, right? To me, this is like, this is like academic fraud, right? Um, because what that suggests is that if we have 130 black students, we'll just use black students for the sake of our conversation, and 120 of them left, but we get 121 next year, it's going to look like we've had improvement. Like this, this is where numbers and statistics like straight up are being miscued to make the, the university or institution look a particular way. And as my colleagues have said, they ain't really about the work, right? So you're incongruent when you wanna put up representations that are not aligned with it, don't reveal and show how people are faring at this institution, right? So mm -hmm. show me some, show me some uh, success in, on the job market for your black graduate students. Show me some success in the, the tenure and promotion ranks. Uh, including all the way through full professors. I think about me being on this panel with black women and we know that black women are, you know, somewhere around 1% of full professors in the academy, right? So don't tell me you, you, you're an ally when you serve on committees that also block the advancement of people's careers or, it, or, or block black students from getting opportunities or in my case, in my own individual case, you know, uh, you don't even tell me about these opportunities. These opportunities don't exist in my world 
but they exist for everybody else. So these notions of diversity and inclusion, and, and, and you know, they, these are just words until, as uh, you know, Amalia mentioned and others talked about, there are some actions that are sustained, that are invested, and folks are holding you accountable to. So I think one takeaway, you know, when we talk about showing up, and if the action is examining policy, uh, make sure your policy isn't whack. Right. Um, the uh, I wanted to uh, transition us. So um, we're currently in a moment of heightened activism. Uh, Treva, you use the term black viability uh, to capture black people's experiences with state initiated and state sanctioned violence. Would you talk about black viability in the realm of education? Is it similar to anti blackness? Can you talk to our participants about what it is, how white people engage in it, and how it can be addressed to show up for Black people? Sure. So I actually thought about the term and was wrestling with the term at the time the video of the assault at Spring Valley High happened when the uh, police officer took the 15-year-old girl, assaulted her out of the chair and was arrested, and the Black girl who filmed it was also arrested. And I was trying to think through the ways when we say the school to prison pipeline, that presumes that the school is a safe place and that we're trying to get people out of prisons and back into our schools and not recognizing the schools as a site at which anti-blackness thrives, where that criminalization begins for so many of our young folks. And black viability was a way for me to think about the various ways that black people are positioned because of white supremacy and anti-blackness to encounter violation. So that can be a fatal violation, whereas encounters with police officers like a George Floyd or Breonna Taylor, or it can be the instances of premature death that Ruthie Wilson Gilmore talks about. And, and also these encounters of harm that impact the ways that we can actually live and thrive, right? So often we're talking about the means by which black folks can survive and we don't even get to the point where we're talking about living and thriving. And viability are all of the ways, the violations that impact our ability to survive, live, and thrive. And so in the classroom, that's how Black folks are disciplined. That's how we're seen as problematic. When you talk about loud Black girls, for instance, that are seen in particular ways, that that loudness isn't seen in the space of creativity or expressivity, but is seen as a problem that then needs to be disciplined, that then puts us into a criminalization model. So already these Black girls in this instance are violable, right? They're positioned to be subjects where they can be violated by the state which sets up a position of criminalization, which sets up a position in which we are often talking about Black girls as a problem, as Black boys as a problem, as Black trans youth as a problem that needs to be solved. So we say things like at risk, um, underserved, as opposed to active verbs that hold accountable the systems that are doing that, right? What made these kids at risk? That's what needs to be called out in how we frame this to talk about where, how are the ways, or excuse me, what are the ways that Black kids are violated in these spaces? And it comes in the elementary schools, in high schools, in middle schools, that we see all kinds of levels of this to the escalation at which they're formally criminalized and put into a system. But we see that criminalization happening when a three-year-old responds in a certain way and a Black child is seen as the problem child, behaviorally wrong. And that leads them vulnerable. So it's another way to think about the vulnerability to the state that Black people are uniquely positioned to have because of white supremacy, because of anti-Blackness. And then you couple that with sexism, transphobia, ableism, homophobia, right? To see how someone ends up in a position of advanced marginalization, as Kathy Cohen would say, where we think about the ways that multiple forms of oppression impact how vulnerable they are to the violence of the state. Um, Amalia, you've done some uh, extensive study of national movements of resistance, most notably the student resistance movements at Mizzou and then those in Ferguson, as you mentioned in your intro, um, following the death of Michael Brown. Now we're, you know, in this same space with uh, Breonna Taylor, George Floyd, and Ahmaud Arbery. Would you explain to our audience <clears throat> what this resistance from Black people is about. Exactly what are Black people resisting and how are white colleagues complicit? And then why is such Black resistance necessary? 
Yes, yes. Um, but before I go in, into that, Lori, I wanted to 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 um, extend what what Treva was saying as far as um, black reliability and uh, talk about how that takes place within systems like school systems, for example, New Orleans. Um, and an example of that is um, the charterization of public schooling. When you have private corporations in charge of education, uh, you can, you'll, you'll start allowing the militarization of the school. You'll start having more, um, you know, checkpoints at school in school buildings and in schools. And we know that that happens on college campuses. Some of my research in New York talked about how community colleges now have um, metal detectors uh, in order to enter and enter those spaces. And so I think uh, policies, federal policies like No Child Left Behind are at the federal level where it starts, where you start seeing a um, removing of autonomy of teachers to, to be able to create spaces for their students and see them as actual human beings and not um, dehumanized by the state. And so in New Orleans, we have, basically we don't have a public education system anymore. It's, it, it's all charterized schools. And so what happens is you get rid of black teachers, you get rid of the community members that were from those neighborhoods teaching in those schools, and you bring in others from across the country, supposedly diverse people to come and teach kids who aren't connected to their communities by the teachers who used to be um, represented there. So it happens through these policies and through these histories of insidious anti-blackness and repression and dehumanization. So I wanted to, 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 to jump off of, of, of Treva's comment to, to discuss that at the, at the policy level and at the federal and institutional level when it comes to, to schooling. Um, and so, yeah, as far as my, my work is concerned, as far as the work I did in Ferguson and, and what is it, you know, what, how is this black, how is black resistance taking place um, in, in, these, in these communities and cities? Well, this is a history of resistance, right? We think about maroon societies in the U.S. We think about, um, you know, during the antebellum period, you know, there was resistance. Uh, you know, enslaved people have resisted and black people and free black people have resisted in many ways for generations in this society. So Ferguson happens um, because it's also a working class black community. So I think that's also a very important context to, to bring in our minds is that working class black communities is where most of these resistance movements ha happen. Um, historically, they've happened in urban centers because this is where blacks migrated north. And this is where they in confronted northern kind of liberal forms of, of, of white supremacy. And so these policies of redlining, policies having to do with housing, concentrated black people in, for example, um, pro project, uh, project housing and, and public housing developments that were places where, um, you know, they weren't being supported as far as, uh, you know, cleanliness and just uh, educational reforms. There were moments where in Philadelphia, you had uh, public housing developments that actually had daycare centers and had um, spaces where you could actually teach and learn with your children. But those quickly started becoming dismantled by um, white supremacist systems of housing. And so these resistance movements come from, you know, are born and are cultivated from these histories that have been present in black working class urban communities up north. And most of my research actually really names what's happening in the, in the historical uh, city and county context. And that external context is critically important to understand issues of educational access. When we're thinking about local access and thinking about economic and, eco and educational mobility within the city, you know, think about Philadelphia. Philadelphia is a, is a population of almost 40% of its, of its residents are black with very, very strong black roots in the community. And when you look at how the poverty line intersects blackness, we know we also have very, one out of four people in Philadelphia are in poverty and children are in, in spaces of high poverty. And it has a lot to do with the economic system and how it's focused on capital and labor. And so we have to look at labor movements, look at local labor movements and its intersection with racial justice movements on campus and off campus. Right, it's that intersection between community and, and student and university. And so uh, mo most of my work talks about these geographic and spatial factors that take place within the histories of these cities that birth you know, these opportunities for activism to come out from the university and from, and from the, uh, the historical city context. 
such as Ferguson, such as New York, and, and now my work in Philadelphia. In Havana and South Africa, I've done work there as well. And it's very similar, right? This African diasporic forms of resistance typically come from, from the local, from the spatial, um, from those imaginations and, and that um, those forms of resistance. So, yeah. Love that. Did anybody else want to jump in here? Okay. Um, Jasmine, earlier uh, in the series, we discussed the rampant nature of anti-Blackness in education as an extension of white supremacy. How might some communities of color engage in anti-Blackness? And this also relates to a question we had from one of our attendees. Um, but what, what, uh, what causes this and what type of paradigm shift needs to occur for other racially minoritized groups to operate in solidarity? Uh, and there's that word again, in solidarity with Black people. Yeah, um, so I, I'm going to answer this question um, using uh, the perspective of um, Latinos, because that's what my, my research expertise is in. Uh, and so, so what, to answer um, the question around what causes this anti-Blackness within Latino communities, um, the same thing that causes it everywhere else, <laughs> white supremacy. Um, you know, that's, that's the root of, of anti-Blackness and anti-Blackness is, is um, an extension of that. Um, and so, you know, if we think about history, um, it, you know, it was white Europeans that came over and, uh, and colonized um, you know, parts of the Caribbean and, and South America, and as a result, um, imposed their ways of being, their ways of thinking, um, which included the, you know, the thought that white skin is super superior to black skin. And that notion has been um, perpetuated in, in different ways um, throughout history and still affects us to this day. Um, it shows up in, in terms of your question, Lori, about how does that, um, how do communities engage in anti-Blackness? Um, specifically within the Latino community, it, it shows up in, in different ways um, from, you know, uh, in the media, there's, a, there's an obvious um, preference for lighter skinned white presenting Latinos. Um, and, and that carries over into everyday life. Uh, I'll give some examples. Um, I, I, I'm gonna guess that most of the people tuned in are probably involved um, in student affairs or on a college campus in some capacity. So, um, so I think the way it shows up within post-secondary education is that uh, Afro-descendant people are largely ignored and or silenced um, within, uh, within the Latino community. So, you know, if, if there is, if you think about programming, um, programming geared towards Latinos, um, African descendant people are rarely mentioned or acknowledged. Um, if, you, if you think about, um, uh, the way we collect data even on campuses, uh, very rarely do institutions allow students to indicate that they identify as both Black and Latino. Um, and so that, that in turn does not allow you to disaggregate data within race, races or ethnicities to look at, at disparities. Um, and so there's a lot of ways that they, they show up on, on campuses. And, and um, oftentimes what happens is Latino students, Latino people like to distance themselves from Blackness um, and, and show that they are uh, more aligned with, with whiteness in different ways. Um, and, and, and that's problematic because the, the, the bottom line is that um, you know, our struggles as marginalized, minoritized people are intertwined. And unless all of us are liberated, unless all of us are free, none of us will be free. 
Um, and so playing this game of oppression Olympics or, or Derek Bell, you know, has a piece around faces at the bottom of the well. Um, it, it's not productive. It's not, it's not useful. And, um, you know, there's not going to be true liberation if we um, are constantly trying to distance ourselves from blackness. Um, so. Can I, can I talk, tag on that? Yes, and um, Amalia and I have written about this together, so please jump in. Yes, yes, I think it's, so Jasmine's work is, is so uh, important. I remember one of your pieces, um, Jasmine, where you talked about um, Latino spaces being um, the most kind of racist space for Afro-Latinos, um, which brings me to the, to the point of, you know, understanding, understanding what whiteness means. So when we're talking about dear white people, are we considering, you know, white passing Latinos as white people, right? Um, because we, it's a slippery slope, right? We have to understand that because these are social con constructs, and I was looking at the chat, because whiteness and blackness are social constructs, and not only social constructs, they're social constructs that are formed within the nation state, right? The U.S. has a particular way that they categorize um, raced people, and whiteness in this society has not necessarily met or equated with Latinidad. Mm -hmm. And so Jasmine and, and, and my work has talked about that. You know, we have a piece talking about blackening, right, the consciousness of Latino people, because Latino people, especially those from the Caribbean, where Jasmine and I are from, I'm from Cuba and Jasmine's um, from Puerto Rico, we have Af the African, the Indian, and the Spanish. That is a part of our identities. And so because of those, those race, that racial, that racial kind of triad, it's important to understand that Latino people have these histories, but come to the U.S. and buy into whiteness, or have had to, in the case of the Mexicans, which is, um, which is uh, recorded in uh, Ian Hanley Lopez's uh, White by Law work, which talked about white cases. In order for Mexicans to, to become citizens and become um, uh, those of the nation state, of the American nation state, they had to become white. And so it shows you that whiteness, they had to, they had to say they were white in order to, in order to become citizens, in order to you know, be able to buy property and it'll be able to um, move up in social mobility in the U.S. And so those kind of histories of whiteness are a part of, of Latino histories and it's important to understand those histories. Um, and so that is a critical part of understanding who are white people, right? Because whiteness is fluid, it changes. It changes over time depending on the economic system, the economic power structures, just like blackness changes over time as well. Although it's based on dark skin, we do know once it gets into those lighter categories, there are moments where you're just like, hmm, is that person really black? And depending on their politics, right? We think of the OJ case. Mm -hmm. People are like, hmm, we don't think this dude is really black, right? So, I mean, it depends. It's, it, it can be fluid. It can be fluid, right? So I think it's important to have these very nuanced conversations about ethnic identity as well. Yeah, and just in the same way that whiteness can be extended to a Latino person, the way as, as Amalia just talked about, um, blackness extends to those that are in the diaspora. So, you know, when when Dr. Patton Davis asks, "What does it mean to show up for Black folks?" Um, inherent and implied in that um, are communities like African descendant Latinos. And I think oftentimes um, lighter skinned or white presenting Latinos um, forget that um, or omit that group um, with, without realizing that, that, that that's, that's inherent, right? You need to show up for um, all of the African diaspora, diaspora and all of the people that are included in that particular conversation. I have a piece um, it, it related to what Amalia was talking about, a piece uh, called um, Anti-Black Latino Racism in an Era of uh, Trumpissimo. I mean, it, it talks about um, some of the data around um, our last election and um, some of the geographic and race and eth ethnicity data around um, who voted for our current president in the last election, um, uh, within the Latino community, what do they look like and where do they live? And, and the data show that it, it was mostly uh, white presenting Latinos in the South that, um, that voted. And I talk about some, um, some of my theories behind that. 
I'm glad you. No, no go, I'm ahead. go ahead. No, go ahead. Go ahead, Lori. Well, I was just going to make the point. I was glad, Amalia, um, you mentioning um, Ian Haney Lopez's uh, White by Law. There's a section in there that talks about law as coercion. And I think that's so critical because we think about it, or, or many people think about the law as this, this uh, universal uh, thing without realizing that for many, um, you know, ethnic groups, that that coercion sort of is about survival. And I think, you know, by the time you go from generation to generation, it just becomes a part of the identity. But I would, you know, I think he makes a good point about just how it shows up, how coercive the law is in making you want to be white. That's the only way you can live. That's the only way you can survive. Um, but it, of course, has consequences for, you know, families and, and communities. Um, go ahead, uh, Derek. And I was going to kind of just make a similar point too, right, is that uh, the law or what's considered as the, the legality of actions informs cultural practices, right? And so given the boundaries that laws create, right, the laws are not neutral, right? They're intended to include some and exclude others. And so just based on this kind of, you know, uh, uh, kind of paradigm that law sits in, it also informs, to your point, Lord, how people try to survive within it while at the same time, for some folks, they might be kind of with a mind was somewhat earlier, they may be resistant in trying to change it, right? So I've got to survive so that I can change it, uh, which means that I'm, uh, I'm colluding in this in some kind of way as well. Um, I wanted to add a couple of points to what Jasmine mentioned. I'm thinking about some of the work that I do out in Cali, uh, especially with regards to uh, black brown relations, right? And so in addition to what Amalia and, and, and Jasmine talked about, we also have to understand like, you know, like white supremacy informs people's ideologies, right? And so regardless of how I might present in, in my racialized self, it doesn't exclude me from, from being informed and influenced by kind of white supremacist ideology, right? So that, you know, uh, as, as somebody mentioned, anti-blackness is, is a symptom of white supremacy. So therefore, if I'm trying to figure out, if, if we're talking about Latino folks from you know, different walks of life, Mexico, Puerto Rico, Cuba, et cetera, um, I'm looking at black folks as my competition, right? So this is rooted in capitalism. There's a finite set of resources, there are finite spaces for employment, finite spaces of housing. So now we become competition or we think we need to be in competition with one another and then that also informs how we socialize our kids and our youth about who those people are, right? So that those are the folks, if I'm black, those are the folks, Latino folks coming in, taking our jobs, pushing us out of our schools, taking our community over. If I'm Latino, look at those lazy black folks, right? So, so, so. Well, white and supremacy, that's what white supremacy wants us yes, to that's, do. That was they just, want, yeah. they want, I want to be very clear that that is the goal of white supremacy. They want us to be distracted and fight with each other because what that does is distract from the larger goal of liberation from oppression. Right. Um, and so this dynamic, uh, Derek, that you're talking about that happens is it's a trap that that you know everyone falls into way too often. Mm -hmm. yeah. Absolutely, that's all. Yeah, I'm just that's that's what your point made me think of. Um, because then I'm distracted about you as my problem, when I'm not looking at white racial oppression as the problem who created these uh, negative conditions that we're all trying to survive in as opposed to thrive in. And so then we can map that to institutions as well, right? Go ahead, Trev. I see you. Yeah, I, th this is such a rich conversation. Thank you all. Um, I'm taking notes on my own, like, oh, I got to get that article now um, to add to my syllabi. But I, I'm thinking intently about this idea of scarcity that uh, presupposes all of this, that white supremacy also operates around the narrative of scarcity of resources, whereby marginalized folks are, as you said, pitted against each other to use this, which only bolsters, right, the functioning um, of racial capitalism in doing that, right? And, and that predication. So if you get more, we get less. And it's like, how do we frame a system of justice in which the answer is there's a finite amount of rights that are available as a finite amount of justice that's available? And that's a lie of white supremacy that we all have to rail against, that we are all in, in, in our societies, I mean, white supremacy is global, but there are these unique ways that it manifests all over the world. 
right? Um, whether you are a colonized nation, imperial dynamic, um, the formation of nation states, white supremacy finds its way in distinct features across the world. But in the context of the US nation state, white supremacy at its inception is like, you're gonna have to be amended into justice, right? So we amend citizenship not until after the Civil War. We're barely 150 years into the concept of citizenship as we know it. And even within that, that citizenship is predicated upon a constitution, a set of laws that intentionally excluded women, excluded enslaved people, free people of color, indigenous people, the original occupiers of this land. So it's not even reckoning with settler colonialism as a praxis. And so looking towards the law often is problematic in its inception because at its core, right, we're talking about it being rotten. And that we grow up in that same white supremacist society. We grew up with the same ideas, hearing the same ideas. So internalization of anti-blackness among various communities means when we say dear white people, I'm also thinking about like, how are we as people engaging white people, the ideas that white supremacy gives us, the idea of whiteness and the power that's given to whiteness. And of course that enlivens anti-blackness and the ways that we imbibe it. So even engaging our students of how you unlearn anti-Blackness is so important, not just for our white students, but for our Black students and other students of color. Because those messages don't miss us simply because we're Black um, and what we're hearing and how we take that on and how laws and systems reinforce that. So Amali, when you brought up OJ, I thought it was so interesting. It's like, oh, right, political Blackness versus like existence. But what was very clear is on that cover of that Time magazine, they made him darker, right? He had to be particularly seen in that moment as a Black person, right? In order to think about what's at stake in this case, that blackness, not just in terms of skin color, but in terms of what we mean when we say blackness and who black people are, if we're going to criminalize that, there's certain markers and features that we do with that, right? So the darkening of his skin and enlightening that, right? Showing him as this violent, aggressive person who's always been this way, never mind that he was the Hertz guy prior to that. But mm -hmm. as soon as we need, in service of proving a particular narrative of criminalization, then he's darker. We can go to aggression, we can go to his physicality, we can rely upon the same kinds of racial stereotypes, stereotypes, anti-Black stereotypes that impact our students in our classroom too, right? And so I think it's important and how even as Black educators, we can reify that. And so Dear White People is also interrogating what are the things that white people taught us and we learned in a white supremacist society that require unlearning as well. And, and to that point, Trevor, so, so as I loop back to what Amalia was talking about earlier with regards to resistance, right, what we're resisting is dehumanization, right? Because that's at the root of anti-Blackness and white supremacy is that you don't matter, right? So, so part of the resistance is in the language, right? And so this is where, um, you know, our, our linguistic capital becomes important. Uh, this is, you know, where we're, we're resisting assimilation Right, we're resisting tokenism, and I, you, you know, all of us can go on and on and on. And so, I just want our listeners to understand, like, it's not a single band of we're just resisting this one thing. All of those things are connected to our suffering and our pain and our dehumanization, and we got to resist kind of where we are and how we can with the tools that we have available to us. Um, otherwise, right, we get more of the same. So uh, Derek, I want to stick with you, um, especially I think the, the OJ um, example is, is really telling. Um, so you, you know, contributed a large body of scholarship on black men in education and you talked about state sanctioned violence against these um, uh, men and how it shows up in uh, education and how it affects their educational trajectories. So would you share one to two key behaviors or actions by white people that diminish black men in educational spaces and tell us one to two promising practices that uh, white educators or educators broadly speaking can implement to affirm black male identities in schools or on college campuses? So when Amalia mentioned OJ, I was like, man, so much we could say about uh, the representation. Yeah, it's, it's so much we can say about the representations and the racial performance, right? Uh, through a historical kind of lens there. Um, but, but to your question, Lori, mm, one to two, man, oh, that's hard. 
Uh, Maybe do one because we're at 154. Okay, okay. Uh, so I'm going to do is, is I'm going to just call it educational neglect. All right. And I want to use that term. Uh, I've written a little bit about this because it encompasses a number of different touch points, which, you know, Jasmine, Trevor, and Amalia have all kind of talked about in various ways. Right. So educational neglect is based on the notion and the ideology that either in some kind of way, it's not even either or black boys, black boys and men can't learn. They are uninterested in learning. Uh, they are uninterested in education or they're less capable. Like we can, we can, that whole gamut, right? Mm -hmm. And so then what does that mean, right? With regards to the practices that people engage in. So if you, if you hold that ideology, regardless of, you know, if, you know, mild sauce from the, from that ideology all the way to the, the worst version of it, uh, means that we're gonna, we're gonna provide less opportunities, we're gonna give less support, and we're gonna afford them uh, less chances to pursue their educational goals um, that they're trying to accomplish. And so then what does that look like? It looks like, uh, the, you know, uh, misrecognition of black male intellect, interests, and capabilities, right? So when we talk about educational neglect, it's very easy. I mean, and, and I think we're in a moment where, I, where we can actually see it, right? All of these institutes, I, I'm a college football fan. So I just, all of these institutions are trying to figure out how can we keep our football teams playing in the middle of a dang on pandemic, right? Um, and to me, we see HBCUs have just, you know, canceled, fought, like, no, we can't do foot. Like, there's no way to do this feasibly. I want to get on. The, I don't want to get on the athletics part of it, but I, I think the athletics part of it is important, right? So that you can be praised and valued for your athletic prowess, but at the same time, uh, when I think about the enrollment of black male students at places like Ohio State and University of Cincinnati, and we can name a whole bunch of other uh, kind of you know major institutions, uh, and the relative number of those individuals who are on sports teams, right? This is interest convergence, right? Uh, you know, Alabama, University of Alabama didn't open up their football team because they thought black players was good because they couldn't beat the, beat the black schools, right? Grambling State in the 1950s was rolling over a University of Alabama. And so it's like, oh, well, we can get some of them to play for us. Anyway, that's, that's a whole nother, my mind is going. So let me, let me be clear. Um, so when we think about educational neglect, it means that there are going to be particular types of obstacles, burdens, and challenges that black men face in order to pursue some of the same educational outcomes as others. So as William Smith talks about, this could be racial battle fatigue, right? Um, as uh, other folks talk about, this could be stereotype threat. Um, this could be the achievement opportunity paradox. Um, this could be what I talk about is black maleness, right? A particular form of racialized, uh, gendered racism that suggests that black men can't achieve. Right. Mm -hmm. So that if we operate from the standpoint that I don't believe you can achieve, whether we say that out loud or not, again, we can look at your actions. If I don't believe that you can achieve, then why would I offer you second and third opportunities? Why would I take your word for granted? Why would I believe that you're capable and you're not, you know, in some cases, quote unquote, making an excuse? Or why would I diminish you and say, uh, as an example, there's one, one guy that I was talking to that's representative of a lot of others said he wanted to be a math, uh, he wanted, he was asking the professor about astronomy. And the professor's response was, well, you gotta be good at math for that. So you're not gonna answer my question. You're gonna work off a presumption that you don't think I have the requisite knowledge and skill in order mm -hmm. to perform well. Mm -hmm. And because he didn't know this young man, he didn't know that this young man was a math major with a 3.7 GPA, right? But what you saw was black male, and you can't do astronomy. So there are ways in which, uh, you know, through educational neglect, black boys and men are repositioned away from educational success simply because of their social identities. And then we can, you know, intersect that with other social identities that become even more damning and more damaging. Um, as it relates to, you know, uh, uh, Trevor's point that she made earlier, right? So then it's no surprise when we see some of the research that comes out there with each increased level of uh, educational uh, uh, attainment black boys and men uh, have higher risk of suicidality, uh, mental health challenges, depression, stress, anxieties, pains, suffering, et cetera, right? And so there's a direct correlation uh, there. So when how, I, think of I was just gonna interject there. So, you know, given 
what you shared about neglect and how this sort of trickles up the the educational trajectory if they make it, you know, there. Like, what? How, how do you turn that around? Like, what? I, I think a lot of these um, the boys and men that you're talking about are in, in white, you know, educational systems. How does that get shifted? Like, so what, the, what's one thing? Yeah. So the main thing, the main way I think about this, and again with multiple ancillary points, is invest in their success. So this is the point that Jasmine was talking about a little bit earlier, right? If I'm bringing you to an institution, why am I bringing you here, right? Am I bringing you here just to be here and we can check some boxes and put on our profile page the numbers for diversity and racial identity? Or if I'm bringing you here for you to be successful, then that necessarily means that I've got to work from a fundamental basis that says I'm investing in your success. So that means that I'm gonna make sure that you have opportunity, you have access to resources, you've got support, you've got guidance, you've got mentorship, and at the same time, I wanna tap into your abilities, capabilities, and, and assets that you came to campus with, right? I had to do some stuff to get here in the first place. So some kind of way, all that stuff that I did to get here kind of is pushed to the side and I've gotta to assimilate to the way you do things as opposed to saying, well, you know, some of the things I do actually can work. So. I think about it from a standpoint of investing in their success so that if we're investing in their success, we're not surprised by their brilliance, right? So I'm, I'm, I'm one of those students where a professor asked me, did I really write a paper? Like, so either I'm gonna lie about this or you just don't believe me, right? So uh, also it means that we're gonna, we're gonna uh, build on their promise and their possibility. So even if you're not all that you can be right now, your past is not, you know, you're not in prison to your past and, and one misstep, one, Failure doesn't make you a failure overall. So, if, you know, a failure is not final, right? Mm -hmm. Because if I'm invested in your success, that means that you might have some missteps. Um, and so, like I said, it's it's uh, it's a it's a notion of uh, thinking about the ways that they belong. It's a way to think about the ways that they are valued. And as uh, my colleague and, and good friend Roger Carey talks about, it's a way that we got to think about their comprehensive mattering. So that if we really want you to be successful, it can't just be athletic success for some of our student athletes. It can't just be success in one realm, but what can we do so that you're learning more about yourself, learning more about what you're capable of, um, and you're working towards some of the things that you've kind of set out that you want to accomplish. Thank you, thank you. Um, so Treva, what about black women and girls? Um, you touched on this earlier, um, as well as you know your work uh, looking at black uh, black trans um, communities, like who are typically forgotten when we speak of state sanctioned violence. Case in point, it took a while before we knew about uh, Breonna Taylor, right? Uh, before there was outrage about her. Um, what behaviors have you seen um, white educators engage in that diminish their educational experiences? And what are some of the promising practices that you've seen? Yeah, um, this is a great question. And I echo a lot of what Derek was saying, that there's similar things that happen with Black girls, um, that kind of stereotyping. I mentioned loud earlier. And I just imagine what educators would do if they took what they consider loudness of Black girls in all kinds of ways, right? It's the loudness of their bodies, it's the loudness of their voices, it's their presence, and thought about what that means in terms of their creativity, what that means in terms of a penchant for expressivity. Right, so using these things that we have problematized on black girls, because it's not problematized on the same ways on white girls in the ways that it is on black girls, on Latina girls, right? It's not problematized in the same way that we see loudness being regarded as such. And so what, are, what is this person doing to be heard? Is this person feeling like they're not heard in my classroom? Is one of the ways to hear loudness differently? And so some of these are the listening practices that we engage when we talk about Black girls in the classroom and their experiences. That if you're taking everything they do to be an affront or a challenge to your authority or power, that you're not actually understanding them as autonomous individuals who are figuring things out, who are coming to the table already as brilliant. I think across the board, one thing we as educators must do is I walk into the classroom expecting brilliance, right? And I don't mean that in this traditional, you're gonna say this in this way. I want you to bring the brilliance that you uniquely come with, which is embedded in your experiences, your cultural background, how you've learned, what you've learned, what you think learning is, and bring that to an, a space of doing that, right? That you as an educator have an opportunity to learn from your students 
in a dynamic way that enriches how you teach, how you think about your pedagogy, and how you connect to a broad range of students. But if you have to leave your experiences, your vernacular, your way of being at the door, then that full person isn't showing up. And that full person isn't imbibing all of the things that can happen in a classroom setting. Because you've already told them that they're insufficient or deficient before they've even had the opportunity to learn anything. Mm. Right? And so demanding that we show up as our sincere and authentic selves and giving space and creating space so that Black girls can come in and be their authentic whole selves, which means they're going to be fallible. We're all flawed. They're going to make mistakes and missteps. But that's also a process of learning as well. And when we rush to discipline and to criminalize the very things that could be molded and shaped into dynamism, then we're missing an opportunity here. And that so often happens with us because we are already, as um, Derek mentioned earlier, and as Amali and Jasmine have touched on in different ways, dehumanized, right? That we're always having to prove our humanity of some way in the classroom, that we need to be exceptionally great in order to be seen in particular ways. And I resist that, and I tell my students to resist that too, that what we're combating is white inhumanity. We're human, period, right? It's whiteness as inhumanity that dictates that we have to negate stereotypes every time we walk into a room that we have to feel like I can't be too loud, I can't wear this kind of clothing, I can't use this kind of vernacular speech when I'm talking or writing, and we allow white supremacy to invade our classrooms and our consciousness and our pedagogical practices that are harmful to black girls. Because we're telling them you're not good enough, that what you're doing is less than, is inadequate. And that's a horrible, message. That's when I say they become violable subjects. That's violating to tell someone they're not enough in who they are when they come through our classrooms. And I especially see this with Black queer and trans students as well, as we as educators doing that are again and having students be the authentic selves and having students really talk about their experiences and how that informs the way they learn, the way they build community, and the way that they're going to take the tools that we're hopefully giving them to build upon those things, to build upon what's already there. We're helping them build upon something that's innately part of who they are. Mm -hmm. When we think that we're just giving them the gift of learning, period, and that they can only get that from us and we're just these transmission vessel vessels, we're failing as educators and we're failing them in terms of learning possibilities. And unfortunately, marginalized folks are always at risk of receiving that kind of transmission of Here's the thing, you do it this way or you're not gonna do it right. right. Or you're not gonna be successful. And to resist that as educators and to think about all of the ways that we can celebrate creativity, intellect, brilliance, uh, uh, and perseverance and tenacity and all of this that we can celebrate, I think our black students will show up differently in our classes, particularly for our black girls and for our black trans, gender non-binary and black LGBTQ students across genders. Wow. All right. Thank you. So we talked about, you know, what um, what this showing up, some of the challenges and, and what this showing up looks like for uh, Black students. But I want to move us into thinking more structurally. Um, Amalia, uh, we've hit on, you know, opportunities not being there, funding uh, uh, and resources not being there, and access simply not being there. What... Um, if we were to reimagine our educational structures, how might they be um, reimagined in a way that serves Black people or, or shows up for them? You're muted. Sorry, yes. Okay. I had to control the fact that I wanted to interject so many times and the mute button was on. So, <laughs> so yeah, so how do we reimagine um, as far as, as, as my role as a, as a professor at university and, and working with, within the university, I think it's important for us educators to know that we, you know, and I'm thinking about Moten and Harney's work on, um, on blackness and the university. We are within the university, but we don't have to necessarily be of the university, right? So we can take the resources of the university and the institutions and not necessarily see ourselves as a part of the machine, right? It's almost like being a cyborg. And I'm thinking of La Paperson's work um, and being cyborgs, right? Like we're part of these machines, we're part of these structures, 
at the same time, we are um, perfect kind of uh, broken manifestations of them as well, right? We're the cracks within the machine, right? So I think it's really important to, to know that we can take the resources, um, we can take the money, we can take the funding, and we can do it with communities that are on the margins, right? For me, I work in urban, in the urban context, so that means working with local communities within the geographies that my institution is a part of, right? And so now, right now, we're actually thinking about um, pilots, right? Payment in lieu of taxes. We're trying to push the university back to doing that, to actually paying taxes and funding appropriately the public education system within Philadelphia. So that, that came off the heels of the George Floyd pro protest in Philadelphia. So through activism, policy starts to be re, you know, re, um, you know, rethought of, um, you know, reapproached by, you know, by the universities and by these institutions, by these cities, because they see that activism is happening. They see that folks are on the ground. They see that there's energy. They see that that the economy is not going to function if we don't address these issues. We need. We see the defunding of police happening in in you know the conversation and policies being put forward across the cities and across cities and counties in, in the US. And I think that comes from, you know, black working class, you know, brown working class, people on, you know, in these communities rising up and saying, you know, we're not gonna work. We're not catching the bus. We're not going to feed the system, um, this economic system anymore until you listen to what needs to happen and, and, and what needs to happen for our students and in our families in these communities. So absolutely working closely with these communities, um, doing research with these communities, thinking about the work I'm going to be doing with, with public housing projects in Philadelphia in the next year, right? When you think about, you know, blackness and you think about class, you know, where does this manifest within the, with the urban and the urban landscape? It's the projects. And you have to be a researcher of class and race um, and geography in order to understand these, these complexities. And I think that in, in higher education, we do a poor job of, of, of doing that kind of local work. You know, mo most of our work is either set within the silo of the university or um, looking at national data sets. And I think it's really important now to localize our work. You know, even with the COVID crisis, it speaks to local, you know, we need to think politically local. Uh, I know the national presidential election is happening and that's very important. At the same time, I think the local elections are something that we should have been engaged in and need to be engaged in, absolutely. Because that's how, you know, that's how we get garbage to get collected. That's how we address um, you know, we address rodents in the cities, and, and that's how we address um, what's happening to, you know, to the dismantling of, of city and housing infrastructure. If, if children don't have a place to eat, if children don't have a place to be safe, if children are, are facing public health conditions, their parents can't go to school, they can't go to school, and it's, you know, it's, it's responding to the environmental racism that comes from, you know, this exploitation of labor that's happening in cities. So again, I'm really pushing this idea in my work and my research and pushing others to think local uh, when it comes to, to thinking about their justice uh, work. Okay, all right. And so this um, takes us to uh, the final question I have for the panelists. Um, what is one thing you want white listeners to know about showing up for black people? So one thing so that we can at least get one or two questions in um, before this session uh, ends. And I'll start at the top again, um, based upon my screen, uh, Treva. Uh, gosh, I was hoping I was at the bottom of the screen. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, be clear about, I, I think I said this earlier, but I wanna reaffirm it. Be clear about what you're willing to give up um, as a white colleague. What are you willing to give up? What is the, the space you're willing to give up? The positions you're willing to give up? Um, I'm thinking about in another industry, uh, uh, Alex, uh, Serena Williams' husband, who stepped down from Reddit and said, I want a uh, woman of color, preferably a black woman to step in and be this person, literally saying, I am going to give up this position because this position should be held by a black woman or a woman of color. We need to actually, what are you willing to put on the line? Not just say I have privilege, but now say, what are the ways I can reckon with that and co-create space, because it's not just you creating space, and co-create space alongside folks I'm in radical solidarity with to address at a very basic level um, what white supremacy looks like. Jasmine? 
Um, the, the one thing I would say is, uh, if you're going to talk about it, be about it. So uh, I think with social media, it's extremely easy to talk about it um, and very easy to pose as an ally or co-conspirator or whatever you want to call yourself. Um, but what really matters are the everyday small actions and decisions that you make um, in your workplace, in how you raise your kids, uh, in your community. Um, and so if you are going to elevate Black women on your Facebook and IG and all that, um, then you should not be uh, condescending or dismissive towards Black women at work, for example. And so my, my one thing would be, if you're going to talk about it, be about it. Mm -hmm. I think that goes with the incongruency. I don't know who mentioned that earlier, maybe uh, Derek, but being congruent, right. Uh, Derek? Thank you. So I uh, just going to do a quick departure because I meant to mention this earlier and it's, I, I, uh, you asked me about like, you know, my work with black men. I, I just wanted to at least mention three names. Um, we know that we're in the aftermath of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor, Ahmaud Arbery, and so many others, Tony McVeigh. Um, but I work at a university. Um, I wasn't here at the time where uh, one of our police officers killed Sam Du Bois. Right? Um, I'm also holding space for Richard Collins III, right, who was killed at Bowie State University. And then I'm also thinking about one of my own guys who um, we, we still don't really have enough information and answers, um, and that's Mr. Wendell Jackson. And so as I, as I think about, you know, what my colleagues have talked about, the ways in which these institutions, you know, are hostile, they're violent, I'm not suggesting that they're all fatal, right? I, even though I mentioned these three, these three men, uh, but there are ways in which we suffer, not only because of our presence in that institution, but also those, these institutions presence in our cities and our communities. Um, so my, my one thing that I wanna take away is, is that this is not a performance, right? Uh, we're not interested in uh, we're not interested in performance, right? Because too many of our lives are at stake or our livelihoods are at stake. Uh, we, we, we've given so much or too much to get not far enough, right? And so we're not, we're not interested in folks who wanna do drive-bys, right? This isn't drive-by activism or drive-by social media. Um, so if you're gonna do the work, be committed to it, which also means that you know, as my colleagues, you're going to take some L's. You're going to, you're going to take some losses. Because if you ain't willing to take a loss, you ain't really committed. Right? Work got to cost you something. And if you're complaining or if you don't feel comfortable being inconvenienced, then you're really not about the work. Thank you. I'm all you. So, I, so I'm thinking about um, Tanahasi quotes and how he says, um, those people who think they're white. <laughs> All right, so the people who think they're white, I think it's important to, to understand that um, as a society, we, we, if we call ourselves a democratic society, and if we call ourselves a society um, of freedom and opportunity and liberty, uh, we have to actually work towards that um, with those who are on the margins and the most marginalized, right? And I think, I don't know if it was, um, I can't remember if it was Nelson Mandela who says, you know, how do you, how do you judge a society? Well, you judge it by understanding who's at the bottom of the, of the system, of the caste system. You have to understand that from a, a class, a race and class lens um, and a gender lens in this, in this society. So I think it's really important to, to understand those, that functioning um, as, a, as a white person or a person who is white passing, um, however we want to define um, how you, you buy into the system. And I think it's critical to, you know, to engage in, in, in politics of, of the economy at the local level. I think, you know, white folks in Philadelphia, for example, when, when activism started, you know, happening, there was support. You know, there was thousands of, of, of white and black and brown 
people, residents in Philadelphia who, you know, who were out in the streets for the George Floyd uh, protest, uh, several. Um, in, you know, these communities of, of, of gentrification, you see Black Lives Matter signs everywhere, and it could be performance. But I'll tell you what, when I was in Missouri, I didn't see those until 2016. It took years for, for white folks to wake up and white businesses to wake up and realize, you know what, you need to really understand who's not present, who's not here. Um, so really recognizing who's your neighbor, who's, who's in your community. And, and making actionable steps at what Treva said and Derek said, being uncomfortable, um, but actually doing, you know, actually doing the work, um, uh, the resistance work locally as well. All right, so thanks to all of you for sharing just these really rich perspectives um, to respond to the question for this particular series uh, and this session. I want to move us into uh, some of the Q&A, some of the questions I think we uh, have answered. I'm going to try to uh, get up one or two uh, answered in the short time we have remaining. Um, one question was, how does white flight affect education? And I think this uh, really ties in to uh, what you were sharing, Amalia, um, the, a, a, and the, the question for this session about showing up. Um, if we're showing up for Black people, we don't just move because they, you know, come into, you know, buy a house in the neighborhood. But I wonder if anyone wanted to respond to uh, this particular question. Well, I mean, white flight uh, affects the, you know, the property tax. If you have a community that was, you know, that had middle class folks who providing a tax base for the school system, and that that those people leave, and then the, you know, and then the the current economic system is 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 segregated and racist against the black people who are in those communities, you aren't going to have a tax base that can fund the schools. And so, white people need to stay put and look at the history and say. You know, and I think in some parts of Philadelphia, some folks, you know, yes, there's gentrification happening. And I would acknowledge I'm a gentrifier too, right? Although I have, you know, black skin, I'm a gentrifier because I come from the university. You know, I came from another city. I'm not from this community originally. I came here and I'm paying, you know, you know, an exorbitant amount of, of, of rental costs to live in this community. But our, my community is predominantly black and brown. And so, you know, it's important to acknowledge, you know, to acknowledge that, to that, acknowledge that fact too. But stay put, you know, stay in these communities and be a part of these communities and listen, listen to your neighbors. You know, I have a, a neighbor who's, who's Mexican. She owns a, flower, a florist. She lives around the corner. And I remember one of the first things, and I know we're going to go back to what, <laughs> what Jasmine and I were talking about, but these ethnic tensions, you know, the Mexican neighbor has anti-Black, you know, feelings towards, you know, the, you know, my African-American neighbors who are selling marijuana in the corner. And that's just how it is. And so, but they were here before she was, you know, but so there's, tensions, these immigrant tensions, there's tensions when it comes to race, and, and, you know, and she could pass for white, you know, that's, that's the reality, and, and it, this whiteness thing is not just what, you know, these white people aren't, aren't people that we, you know, they're not blonde hair, blue eyes, and, you know, that's not what's happening in these communities, there's these white passing folks who have power, who own businesses, and, you know, and are being, you know, are being racist towards the people who have been in these communities for generations, and so, staying put and being taught. And, and in my case, you know, I had to teach her about anti-blackness uh, and for, for her to understand that you can't call the police on, on, the on, on our neighbors, right? They were here before you were, you were, you know, and you get mad because you're talking about people don't want you in this country, right? So kind of meeting people where they're at in their racism and meeting people where they're at with, with you know, in their, in their um, you know, Americanism. I think that's really, really key and important. And those are white people too, right? Mm -hmm. Even if you have a particular ethnic identity that may sometimes make you brown, it's that fluidity, it's that nuance, it's that liminalness that, that I feel like we have to really name. Thank you. Um, another question, many accrediting bodies have standards that say programs must work to recruit and retain a diverse faculty and student body, yet there are absolutely no guidelines to help with, this init with these initiatives and enhance the quality of programs by having a diverse faculty and student body. What can be done for higher ed institutions to truly recruit and retain diverse people? I'll jump, okay, go ahead, Jasmine. I, I mean, I, I was just gonna say, like, th this could be a whole nother webinar series, um, first of all, <laughs> so, uh, just in the interest of time, of time, so that maybe we could get to one more question. 
I, mean, I, I think the, the, the long and short of it is, you know, what needs to be done to increase enrollment persistence completion for communities of color is for institutions to implement anti-racist policies and practices. So like that's, you know, the, the, the bottom line. And, and then, you know, and what is an anti-racist policy and practice? If you're, if you have policies and practices that uh, largely disproportionately benefit white students, white faculty, uh, then it's racist <laughs> and in turn, not, you know, anti-racist. And so, um, you know, it's, it's pretty straightforward in terms of racist, anti-racist, <laughs> and um, what what we need to do to to retain those students is um, increasingly advocate for and implement anti-racist policies and practices. Can you uh, just to to add on to what you were saying, Jasmine? Can you talk a little bit about? Um, the, the racial justice funding from Lumina, like I think that uh, signals a shift in Lumina's work and um, some of the, their expectations and working with, you know, folks who want to be funded. Um, like they're, they, I think the scrutiny around equity is much greater. Um, and I think Lumina has been a model for that. Can you just talk a little, give a little snippet of that? Yeah. So, uh Um, we, we started uh, uh, some years ago a racial justice and equity fund and um, in that work we, 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 we put out an RFP um, uh, for, for the first round of funding and, and um, funded uh, um, a bunch of institutions across the nation and, and in that work um, we what we were looking for was institutions that had already been doing the work, um, not institutions that had uh, surface level commitment, um, but institutions that were building around a commitment they already had, you know, institutions that already had skin in the game, so to speak. Um, and so, um, you know the the reason why we we started that fund was one to signal to the field an explicit commitment to racial justice and equity um because um that's not historically something that's been done within philanthropy before uh but also we found in, in our work in, in our funding in post-secondary education that if you are not explicit about wanting equitable outcomes across all races and ethnicities, then um, grantees will not deliver on those outcomes. Um, and so we have had to become very explicit and bold in saying that um, for Lumina, what success looks like is a dismantling of equities across racial and ethnic groups. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And I think that sort of um, philosophy can translate to higher ed institutions. Like there's not a lot of explicitly stating things. I think this year was the first year where I saw um, presidents and leaders actually naming racism and white supremacy in a way, it, their statements, of course, but naming things in a way that they just had not previously. Um, and so I think for listeners, as they think about showing up, part of it is you got to name it. You can't dance around it and call it 50 different things, name it and then, you know, create the structure or create the conditions so that people feel that there is some level of accountability. Um, so I, because we're running out of time and we have two minutes, I want to stop here and thank you all for being panelists for this fourth uh, and final session of the Dear White People series. I also am thankful and grateful to our uh, previous panelists. All of you have just provided a wealth of knowledge and wisdom. I've been taking copious notes uh, as we've gone through today's session. Um, but collectively, we've done what we intended, which was that we wanted to host um, a set of conversations that would allow those within and beyond the uh, Ohio State uh, community 
to really think about what it means when we talk about whiteness and white supremacy and anti-blackness and anti-racism, all terms that, you know, lose their weight when they become these, you know, keyword phrases that we just kind of, they lose their power after a while. And so um, uh, we wanted this to be uh, uh, an opportunity to talk about these things and really to think about what they mean in terms of serving black communities, but also naming uh, uh, white people and, and their complicity um, in uh, some of the conditions that black people are facing. And so, you know, no series, of course, would be, uh, can be comprehensive enough to tackle all that we tried to tackle, but we really do hope these conversations have prompted everyone's thinking and more importantly, will be used to guide your actions. Um, uh, we do have some future professional development opportunities coming up uh, in the next few months. Um, but for those of you who are looking for uh, these recorded conversations, they will, uh, uh, Dr. Arnold has posted the link multiple times uh, in the chat box, but please do visit, use them for your own professional development within your own, within, within your respective organizations. Um, and then because for those who have registered, you're automatically a part of our mailing list. So as other opportunities avail themselves, we will reach out to you. Again, thank you to our audience, uh, those who have attended all four or maybe just today, you know, when you can. Thank you for participating. Um, and again, thank you to our panelists, my colleagues who helped pull this together. And I will sign off um, with that. Enjoy the rest of your week. Thanks Thank so you, much. Laurie. Thanks, Noel, for having us. It's been, it was a great, engaging session. Absolutely. Yeah, thanks so much. Just so much CRT came out of this conversation. <laughs> Class. I got a page of notes myself, Lori. So I, 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 I've been <laughs> oh writing. It's like, man, I got to get Jasmine article. What I'm, I'm sleeping on that one. So I, yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. yes, yes. Thank you all for your work, too. Uh, not only Lori and Noel, but uh, Trevor, Amalia, and Jasmine. I'm familiar with you all in some ways, but it's just really great to be in, in community with you all and do the work. So I really am humbled and grateful. Yes, yes, me too. Thank you guys. Y'all were amazing. It was. It was Thanks, Noel, in the background. Oh. <laughs> I change up my game every week, but. <laughs> <laughs>